Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as of a root out of the dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is led as a lamb before the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare this generation? For he was cut out of the land of the living, and by his stripes we are healed. From Isaiah chapter 53, we read a prophecy of the suffering servant. From his introduction into the world in, in Matthew chapter 1, we read about the genealogy of Jesus. In verse number 18, following to verse number 25, we read about how his mother was going to uh, uh, e e eventually give birth to him into this world and that prophecy being fulfilled. Of course, we know in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14, a virgin is going to conceive. She's going to bear his son and we're going to call his name Emmanuel. In Luke chapter 2, the shepherds were alerted of the good news of the, of the prophecy of all the verses that they knew and loved. That prophecy was now about to be fulfilled in the coming king. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 14 that they look forward to this day. In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 42, the Bible there says how the child grew in spirit in a statue with man. In Luke 2 and verse number 52, there the Bible reveals for us how he grew in wisdom, knowledge, and stature with God, and also that with man. But that suffering servant, that Messiah, that seed promise of Genesis 3 verse 15 is now hanging on the cross, suspended between two, three, two, two thieves. As our Lord is on the cross, he utters seven sayings that uh, many of us know and that we study those on a daily basis. And those seven sayings that he uh, said that day some over 2,000 years ago were still gaining from those truths this very day. First of all, our Lord, as he is hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, verse number 34. The second saying that he uttered on the cross was, uh, Today to the thief, today thou wilt be with me in paradise. Luke 23, and verse number 43. As he looks at the foot of the cross, there's his mother. And in John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27, Jesus says, Woman, behold thy son, and to that disciple whom he loved, behold thy mother. In Matthew chapter 27, and verse number 46, Jesus utters that great prophecy of Psalm 22, verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In John chapter 19 and verse number 29, Jesus utters the word, I thirst. In John chapter 19 and verse number 30, Jesus says, it is finished. And according to Luke chapter 23 and verse number 43, Jesus says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Bible says he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. The Bible reveals for us, according to John, James, John chapter 2, verse number 19, and also Luke chapter 14 and verse number 58. Jesus often gave his disciples hints that three days his body was going to be in the tomb, and, th and on the third day he was going to rise again. But ultimately, we know they were so caught up in the hype, so caught up in the encouragement of knowing that Jesus was with them. Jesus was not only recognized by his disciples, we see in Mark chapter 4, verse number 35 and following, and also Matthew chapter 8, verse 21 and following as well, as Jesus is in the bottom of this boat fast asleep. 
His disciples go down and they awake him and he goes out and he calms the storm. And, they, and, and, and their conclusion is, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey his voice? Even his enemies recognize, you know what, we've never heard a preacher like this. Never has any man spake like Jesus of Nazareth. His enemies even recognize that. But his enemies, according to John chapter 19, verse 9 and 10, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself to be the Son of God. Brother, and I submit to you this morning, Jesus didn't make himself to be the Son of God. He was the Son of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Verse 14, that Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. But that Jesus, the Bible says he bows up his head, and he gives the ghost. And the Bible says that they asked Pilate to return the body to them, the end of Matthew chapter 27. And as they take the body of Jesus and as they lay the body in the tomb, even though Jesus again constantly told them that he was going to get up the third day, even though Jesus constantly told him that the death, the grave was not going to hold him, they still failed to realize failed to understand the importance of what was about to take place, take place some three days later. Three words that Christianity stands and falls on. Three words that give us so much hope, so much comfort, so much encouragement. Three words that as we look at our section of scripture for today, as we look at our study, we can take comfort and hope in knowing that he is risen. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. Jesus decided to get up exactly as he said he would. And Paul says over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7, Paul says that same power that our Lord used to raise himself from the dead, that power is displayed in all of us and all of God's children this very day. And as Christians, we should take great comfort in knowing that he is risen. I want to share with you this morning four points, make some application, and then, of course, the lesson will be ours today. The first point I want to look at with you this morning is these two Marys, how they go to the empty tomb. It's so interesting because when you look at the account in Matthew chapter 28, verse number one, the Bible says, and it came to pass when they decided now to go and to uh, anoint the body of Jesus. In fact, the account in Luke over in Luke chapter 24, verse number one, that account said they bring these spices and there they're going to go to anoint, uh, uh, anoint the body of Jesus. And it's so interesting because when you look at the four gospel accounts and you put them side by side, each of them gives us a, a different illustration or a different a viewpoint, if you will, of what we find. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse number one, the Bible says these two Marys, they go to the sepulcher where his body lay. And as they see the stone has been rolled away, verse number six, he is not here. Now, again, in their minds, where is the body of Jesus? His body should be in that tomb. The angel said he is not here for he is risen. And the Bible says the angel said, go tell the other disciples that the Lord got up from the grave. The account in Mark chapter 16 and verse number seven, the account in Mark says, as these two Marys, uh, 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 as, as these two Marys discover the empty tomb in verse number seven, the Bible says, go your way and tell Peter. I always find that little phrase amazing because if you remember only a few days before Peter was the one who denied our Lord three times. In Luke 22, verse number 31, the Bible says, And the Lord says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as we. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. When you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Our Lord said, before the cock crows, before the sun comes up, Peter, you would have denied me three times. Peter said, in essence, Lord, it's not going to be me. But before the sun came up, as revealed for us in Luke chapter 23, Peter goes into the hall of Caiaphas and the little maid notices Peter and says, weren't you one of those ones who were with Jesus? Peter says, I know not the man. 
Second time someone else identified Peter, Peter said, I know not the man. And it's so interesting because when you get over to Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says Peter begins to curse and to swear, saying, I have no idea who the man is. The man, as we heard moments ago from Michael, the man who drew his sword to cut off the ear of, our, of, of Malchus. Now he's saying he has no idea who the man is. But it's so amazing because we see the love Christ has for all of us this very morning. Because here you have Peter so despondent, so discouraged, so uh, uh, full of discouragement. Peter gives him some comfort. Well, Jesus gives Peter some comfort. And the Bible says in John chapter 20, verse number four and verse number five, the Bible says that as that Mary tells the disciples that Jesus has resurrected from the dead, many of these disciples, 11 of them, that is, they didn't even believe what these two Marys were saying. But the Bible says Peter, he got up. And the Bible says in John 20, verse 4 and 5, Peter begins running to the sepulcher. And the Bible says in him stooping down and looking in. I love that phrase or that terminology there, stooping down, because that's also translated in James chapter 1 and verse number 25, where James says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the same word. And the Bible there says, you can look at it from both ways. James says, but a man who will stoop down and dig into the word of God, James says that man will be blessed. But the same word is translated. When Peter goes to that sepulcher, he's full of excitement. Because Peter had gotten word that his Lord was looking for him. Peter had gotten word that his Lord had resurrected from the dead. But many of those disciples, they simply did not believe. Which brings us to our second point this morning that we find in Luke chapter 24, 13 and verse number 35. As Jesus is on this Emmaus road, he encounters two individuals, one by the name of Cleopas and the other one, the Bible doesn't give us the name for that individual. And the Bible says as they are walking from Jerusalem back to the town where they were living in, which was about seven miles off. The Bible says that Jesus and the Bible also says that he had somehow hidden himself from them. So they have no idea that it's Jesus with whom they are having a conversation with. And the Bible says that Jesus begins asking these men, why are you so discouraged? More or less, why has your countenance fallen? And these men tell Jesus, where have you been the past three or four days? Don't you know that Jesus of Nazareth, he's not in the tomb anymore. You can feel the anticipation from Cleophas and the other individual. You can feel the concluding thoughts that began to shape within their minds. But these men also show us something that I think we should take note of this morning. These men have all the facts right up until the point that they do not. These men are discouraged. And it's so interesting because that as Jesus is about to have a conversation with these men, Jesus is going to remind them of what verse number 27 of everything that concerned the uh, law of Moses, all the prophecies and everything the prophets had talked about up to that point. And I often wonder what prophecies did Jesus share with those men on that day? Maybe Jesus talked to them about Genesis 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Maybe Jesus told them about Psalm 22, verse number one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Jonah chapter one and verse number 17, Jonah says in three days in three nights, I was in the fish of the belly. And then maybe Jesus said, that's exactly what you all are overlooking. Maybe Jesus shared with them, Isaiah chapter 53, who have believed our report and who into our, is the arm of the Lord revealed. Maybe Jesus shared with them, Micah chapter 4, verse number 1, O Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands, ultimately talking about himself. You see, church, our hearts are terrible teachers, but they're good students. 
Very often we wake up in the morning and our hearts, they tell us what we're going to do, how we're going to feel. No, sir, no, ma'am. We should tell our hearts every single day. We need to get into the word of God. We need to stay into the word of God. And the fact that Jesus got up from the grave. Brethren, that's something that we should rejoice about. As Christians, we don't walk around feeling sorry for ourselves. As Christians, we walk around singing a new song. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. As Christians, we walk around singing, His grace, it reaches me and will last to all eternity. Now I'm under His control and I'm happy in His soul just to know that His grace, it reaches me. Paul says, if you keep it in the context in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 20, making our way over to Ephesians 2, verse 1, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2, verse number 5, Paul reiterates that. But in verse number 8 and verse number 9, Paul says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Paul in that context talks about, again, the power, verse number 7 of chapter 1, that resurrection power is the same power we have today. And those disciples on the road to Emmaus, here they are concerned, so despondent. They even tell Jesus, well, we've also received word from those Marys that when they went to the sepulcher with the body of our Lord lay, it was not there. If the empty tomb of our Lord is not proof enough for those in the world who simply just believe that how can a man get up from the grave? How can a man allow the blind to see? But when you read the book of John and you read those seven miracles, we are reading about the power and the majesty of our God. In John chapter 2, he turns the water into wine. In John chapter 4, he heals that nobleman's son. In John chapter 5, he, hears, he, he heals the daughter of Jairus. He walks on water. He feeds five thousand, well, more than five thousand people with just a limited amount of resources. What else does our Lord do? In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. That takes in John chapter 11. I love it for so many reasons because those disciples tell Jesus, we've gotten word that Lazarus, your friend, is sick. And Jesus ultimately tells them, I know Lazarus is sick, but a greater work of God, it has to be done and it has to be displayed. And the Bible says that when Jesus goes and sees Mary and Martha, the Bible says in verse number 35, how he weeps. But Jesus says, show me where you laid them. Show me where his tomb is. Jesus goes down and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, Lazarus, wrapped in grave clothes, come out of the tomb. Christ says, loose the man and let him go. That power, that same power is what we have as members of the body of Christ this very morning. Jesus, as he is talking with these men on the road to Emmaus, again, these men are discouraged. And so these men, next of all, they ask Jesus to come into their home and abide with them. And what's so amazing is because when you read the gospel accounts, and oftentimes when Jesus was extended an invitation by individuals, more often than not, he accepted that invitation. He wanted to go into the homes of individuals. He wanted to talk with them. He wanted to show them that he truly was the son of God. We need not today to look for another prophet. We need not today to open our Bible and say, maybe Jesus wasn't the Christ as many in the world today. Jesus is the Son of God. And the Bible constantly proves that. The empty tomb shows us that. Jesus is going to accept these men invitation. In Luke chapter 24, verse number 28 and following. And as Jesus goes into their home, and the Bible says Jesus, he begins breaking bread with these men. And the Bible says that as soon as these men recognized who they were in the presence of, that Jesus vanished out of their sight. And the Bible says that these men say, did not our heart burn within us when he opened us with us the scriptures and taught with us by his way? And the Bible says those men said, we got to go back to Jerusalem. Because we have, have to tell more people that Jesus has risen. When we are convicted about the resurrection of Jesus, you know what happens? We want to tell other people about it. 
In John chapter 4, the woman at the well, after she had that conversation with our Lord and after he began telling her all the things about her, the Bible says in verse number 35, how she leaves her water pot, she goes back and she tells everyone, come see a man who's told me everything there is to know about me. We should not keep the gospel to ourselves. The gospel is that which changes a person, takes us from sin to salvation, from sinners to saints, from lost and found. All of us have been there, and all of us have lived through the difficulties and the frustrations of sin. But to know that we can get rid of that sin, to know that, again, his grace reaches us, To know that we can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that should encourage all of us to be convicted by the fact that we should share the gospel with everyone that we know and love. And it's so interesting because our last point, the last thing Jesus does with these disciples is to give them the Great Commission. To go out, Matthew 28, Luke 24, 46, John chapter 20, 20 and 21, excuse me, John chapter 20, 14 and following. He gives these men the great commission to go out and to preach the gospel. But Jesus, well, first of all, these women, they see the empty tomb. Jesus uh, speaks with them or he talks with these men on the road to Emmaus. But third of all, our third point this morning, what we see next after the resurrection of Jesus is that he appears to his disciples. As his disciples are still just completely blown away by the fact that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. Here they are more or less in this room. The Bible reveals for us that in Luke chapter uh, 24, Mark chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 28. Here they are in this room. And again, they just cannot believe that Jesus had got up from the grave. But now Jesus is going to appear to his disciples. And the Bible says that Jesus is asking these men, why are you so discouraged? I heard a thought a couple years ago when I read a thought and I thought it was pretty good. Could the most pointing, could the most uh, disappointing day in our Lord's life was when he came out of the tomb and absolutely no one was there. I said, man, what a thought. He told these men that he was going to get up from the grave. He told these men that again, John 2 verse 19 Mark 14 and verse 58, that he was going to tear his body down and in three days he was going to get up again. These men knew this information, yet it just didn't register with them. And so Jesus appears to these men and Jesus is asking them, why are you all so discouraged? Why are you all so despondent? And oftentimes in life, we feel the exact same way. We feel as if God is not with us. God is not for us. God is somehow detached from what's going on in the world. But the one thing we can always take our minds back to is the fact that Jesus got up from the grave. And because Jesus got up from the grave, brethren, we can get up from sin. We don't have to stay in sin. We don't have to feel sorry for ourselves. We can get up and we can do something about it. It's so interesting because sometimes we get in our own head. And sometimes we allow the devil to distract us. Next time the devil shows up in your life, you know what you should do? Just agree with him. Just agree with him. Yes, I used to be a sinner. Yes, I used to lie more than anybody in the world. Yes, I stole from others. Yes, I did things I shouldn't have done, but I'm no longer that person because of Jesus. I don't do those things anymore. Jesus appears to these disciples and they're just so discouraged. And Jesus just gives them a few words to calm their hearts. Peace be unto you. But we read in John chapter 20, one of those disciples was not there. You know, I, 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 I've thought about it long and hard. I read all different types of books. I wonder as to why Thomas was not there. I often wonder where Thomas was when the other disciples were in that room. A couple speculations. One person said, well, maybe Thomas was just so despondent by the fact that his Savior had died. And we often look at him as doubting Thomas. But the other two times Thomas is mentioned in the book of John, John chapter 11, 
John chapter 14 and verse number five. The other times we read about Thomas in this book, he's not a person who is discouraged. He's a person who is convicted about his Lord. But in John chapter 20, Thomas was not there when the other disciples were there, which shows us, brethren, when we are not where God wants us to be, we miss something. When we are not in the assembly of God, if we're not sick, if we're not working, we're going to miss something. Because that encouragement, Hebrews 10, 24 and following, that edification that you need, brethren, we can't do that at home. God wants us to be here. And again, whatever reason Thomas was not there, it didn't matter. But again, Thomas goes and he hears information again, John chapter 20, verse number 20 and following. And John receives the information that G. Thomas, that is, he's received this information that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Thomas said, unless I put my hands on his hands, unless I put my hands on his side, Thomas said, I will not believe. In our culture today, we hear about great athletes. We hear about great sports figures. And oftentimes, one person may say, this is the greatest professional athlete I have ever seen. This is the greatest up and coming person of this sport I've ever seen. And what do we say next? You know what? I have to see it for myself. There is no way I can simply take someone's word for it. I have to see it with my own eye. And the Bible says that when Thomas was with them the second time, Jesus stood in the midst of them and he turned his attention toward Thomas. And he said, Thomas, put your hands where my hands were. Put your hands onto my side. And Thomas's reaction should be our reaction every time we approach our father. Thomas's reaction should be our reaction every time we think about the resurrection. My Lord and my God. Thomas. We often look at him as a doubting individual, but I believe Thomas just wanted some confirmation which I think that's a lesson all of us can take. Don't take people's word for it. If it's not in the word of God, brethren, don't listen to it. If a person says something that's not in accordance with the word of God, we have to investigate that because we have to obey God. First of all, we have to make sure our lives and our families are in accordance with the word of God. Thomas said, unless I see, I won't believe. But after Thomas saw him, Thomas believed. And then our Lord said to Thomas, blessed are they which believe and have not seen me. Brother, and that's all of us this very day. Before I give you the last point this morning, I want to look at some application thoughts with you before the last point. When we think about this topic, Jesus rises after the cross. What does that really mean for the child of God this very day? First of all, it shows us that we have hope in Jesus because he got up from the grave. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Question, why would Paul have to make known the gospel to people who had already responded to that gospel? You see, in every chapter in 1 Corinthians, these brethren had a problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, they were divided over preachers. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, they were confused over spiritual wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, they were carnal minded. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, they were hypocritical in judgment of people, so on and so on. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to them concerning the great resurrection chapter. They did not understand that. Paul says, moreover, brethren, now I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you receive, wherein you stand, by which you are also saved, if you keep in memory that which I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, what, Paul? How that Christ, how he died for our sins, how he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Question, how many people would it take to say someone is innocent of a crime? How many people would it take? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 4, the Bible there says, He was seen of Cephas, that being Peter, and then the other eleven. In verse number 6, the Bible says that he was seen of up to 500 brethren. And Paul said at that time, many of them were still alive. How many people would it take to consider a person free? How about one? How about twelve? 
How about over 500? All of these people saw Jesus after his resurrection. We have hope over death and the devil itself. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14, the Hebrews writer says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, even so by himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he may destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver him who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Who would have ever thought that, that God would come down to, head to earth to be what he created? He tastes upon flesh so he can defeat the devil in death itself. It takes us to the mind of God. Put yourself in the shoes of all of those people at the foot of the cross, knowing that all their hopes, all their dreams were wrapped up in the Messiah. The Bible says he died. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But Jesus didn't stay in the tomb long. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50, Paul there gives us again that uh, great picture of what it's going to be like in our great resurrection. Paul says that death in Hades, John that is, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, death in Hades will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, Paul says, But thanks be to God, which given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the victory is already won. We are already on the winning side. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35, Paul says, Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sore, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Brethren, we're conquerors in Jesus. And all that is made possible by the resurrection of Jesus. We have hope in Jesus. We have hope because of the resurrection. But not only that, not only do we have hope, Jesus getting up from the grave. You know what that proved? That proved that Jesus was the son of God. Jesus getting up from the grave, it shows us that everything he said about himself, he was right. Because Jesus was right. Because Jesus got up from the grave. Because Jesus said that in three days, he's going to tear his body down. He's going to build it up again. Because Jesus was right. Brethren, we can go to heaven. And we don't have to walk around again feeling sorry for ourselves at the fact that what if Jesus didn't get up from the grave? As Brother Jonathan alluded to earlier, brother, we will have no hope. If Jesus didn't get up from the grave, there would be no point of any of us being in here this morning. But you know what? Jesus got up from the grave. Jesus didn't need an alarm clock. Jesus didn't need anyone to come knock on the tomb. Jesus got up exactly when he said he would. Why? Jesus doesn't just have some power. Jesus just doesn't have most power. Jesus says, all power, all authority, Matthew 28, 18, has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus got up from the grave. It gives us some hope. Jesus getting up from the grave proves that he is the son of God. Jesus getting up from the grave, it shows us that he was right. But what else does it show us? Jesus getting up from the grave, it affirms to us that he established his church. Jesus tells these men in Luke chapter 24, verse number 46 and following, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. These men were to wait in the city of Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit. And at chapter 1 and verse number 4, Jesus is going to be alive for 40 days. Luke reveals for us that he's going to show them many infallible proofs. But our last point, number four, again, Jesus, we see the empty tomb. We see Jesus on the road to Emmaus. We see Jesus appears to his disciples 
But while he appears to his disciples, Jesus gives them a great commission that is still our commission this very day. Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them. Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16. Luke chapter 24, 46 and following. We see that and we understand that. And in Acts chapter 2, we find New Testament Christianity. We find that first gospel sermon that was preached. And in verse number 22, Peter begins preaching. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved by God by the miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of yourselves as ye also know. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge, Jesus says, you all with your wicked hands, you all have crucified him. Peter says it was not possible for him to be holding of it. Peter says it was not possible for the grave to hold him. He goes on to say how David is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us until this day. But in verse number 36, Peter says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked to the heart as Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren. What shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Imagine the comfort that came over the hearts of those people. Only about a month and a half before, many of them shouted, crucify him, crucify him. They were there. He saved others himself he cannot save. When those guards said, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. But Jesus, he decided to stay there because he loves us. In John 10, verse 17, John says, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my Father which is in heaven. Because Jesus got up from the grave, because Jesus, because he is risen, brethren, we have hope. We have an expectation of going to heaven and being with our Father. Jesus rising after the cross. It's not where the story ends, but it's where it begins for all of us. From his introduction to the world, he was marked for death. We often emphasize the birth as we should. We often emphasize the life as we should. We look at the resurrection as we should. And all those truths help us should help us want to be more like him every day. In 1992, an individual by the name of Rob Richmond was running in the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona. He was running the 400 meter race. And as he begins running, he's feeling good. Everything is going well. It's so interesting that here you have many of these Olympic athletes, they train three and a half years for something that's going to take, depending on what you're running for, uh, maybe 10 seconds, a hundred yard dash. Again, they, they train some three and a half years for something that's going to take just a little bit, a limited amount of time. And as he's running, he pulls his hamstring. Later on in 2012, he did an interview talking about that very event in his life. And he talked about all the thoughts that he had going through his mind up to that particular time. He talked about how he trained so diligently for this particular race. So interesting that the two qualifying races before that, he ran and he won, and it wasn't even close. But on this race, he ran and he pulled his hamstring. And he begins hobbling. And many of the doctors begin running down. And he talks about in 2012 how many of those doctors wanted him to stop running, to stop himself from furthering the hamstring anymore. But in the middle of the stands comes a man running down. 
help him. It was his father. And he has a conversation with his father. He more or less tells his father that I'm done. I can't do it. And the father tells him, you know what? You don't have to prove anything to anyone else. Four years before, when he was running for a race, he had next to his name, did not run. And he goes on to say this race he did not want to say, did not finish. So he told his father, I got to keep going. And the father said, I want you to lean on me and we'll finish this together. And they finished that race. Even though he came in last place, he finished. He finished that race. That pales in comparison to the comfort and the assurance that we have in our Father in Heaven. Our Father in Heaven, He implores us, He begs us to look to Him for our strength and our comfort. Because Jesus got up from the grace, because He is risen, brethren, we can finish our race. We can go to heaven and we can be with our Savior. Jesus rising after the cross is a great event for all of us. In 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2, John reveals for us that uh, we have a propitiation, an atonement for our sins. In 1 Timothy 2, verse number 5, there Paul says, For we have one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus, our intercessor, our lawyer, our advocate. Hebrews 4, verse 15, pleading our case to the Father. Brethren, as we leave out of here today, we don't have to leave out in doubt or despair or discouragement because the fact that Jesus got up from the grave, the fact that Jesus is risen should give us the hope and comfort of knowing that we can go to heaven and be with our Father in heaven for all eternity. I don't know this morning who is or who's not a Christian in here, but I would encourage you from those of us who are Christians that being a child of God is the greatest life you can live. Knowing that sometimes we say things and we do things we ought not to do, but knowing that we can always come back to the Father if we're humble enough to ask him for forgiveness on the other side of your repentance, you're going to find the forgiveness of God. If you're not a Christian this morning, we would encourage you to become one. And those of us who are Christians, sometimes we lose our way. Sometimes we wander into the far country of life. Sometimes we leave the Father's side. But just as surely, as surely as that prodigal son came back home to the Father, we can come back home to our Father today. And we will pray with you and pray for you and rejoice in the fact that you were lost, but now you're found. Aren't you thankful that God has a lost and found section? God just doesn't leave us lost. God gives us a way to come back to him to make it right. Jesus is risen. Death and devil are defeated. And we have the victory because of him. If we can help you this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat>